This is an Iraqi in still suit from the movie Dune, and I actually made one. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. This is a motorcycle jacket. But could you actually make one? Now, this one is interesting because there's a lot of science and engineering at play here to make it so you could survive in the harshest climate in the galaxy with minimal to no water loss. So today, let's see if it would actually be possible to build one and what that might look like. I'm Ricky, and this is 2-Bit Adventure. This video is sponsored by Lark. So in the movie, the still suit is described like this. It's basically a micro sandwich, a high efficiency filter and heat exchange system. The skin contact layer is porous. Perspiration passes through it, having cooled the body near normal evaporative processes. The next two layers include heat exchange filaments and salt precipitators. Salts reclaimed. Motion of the body, especially breathing and some osmotic action provide the pumping force. Reclaimed water circulates to catch pockets from which you can draw it through this tube in the clip in your neck. Urine and feces are processed in the thigh pads. In the open desert, you wear this filter across your face, this tube in the nostrils with these plugs to ensure a tight fit. Breathe in through the mouth filter, out through the nose tube. With a Fremen suit in good working order, you won't lose more than a thimble full of moisture a day. So that is a really bold claim, but to understand just how impressive that is, how much water do most of us lose on a given day? Well, it turns out it's different for men and women. Check this out. For the average man, about 40% is lost in urine, no big surprise, feces 10%, exhaled air through the lungs 10%, insensible perspiration, meaning perspiration not from like visible sweat, but just from water leaking out through your pores, 10%, and active perspiration about 27%. All in, that's about 3.6 liters of water. That would be 3.6 of these bottles of water every day. Now, if you're thinking you don't drink that much water in a given day, well, all the food you eat also has water in it. Interestingly, it's less for women. As you can see, it's only about 2.7 of these that you would have to consume for the average woman. Now, as I'm saying this, I'm gonna take this off because I am absolutely sweating my... So from an engineering perspective, we would need at least these six things. One, a suit. Two, a cooling system. Three, a system to capture the air that we breathe out. Four, urine and feces collection. That's a fun one. Five, water treatment and six, the energy source to power all of it. Let's start number one and talk about how Dune tackles the still suit. The still suit's fabric is known as still cloth. It's a complex micro sandwich of tubes and special fabric. The innermost layer is a porous membrane that allows sweat to go and do its thing, evaporating and passing through after cooling the skin. The next two layers include heat exchange filaments and salt precipitators. That would be like a semi-permeable membrane to separate the water and the salt. Now that part is actually really difficult to do. We'll get to that here in a second. But the suit itself is pretty straightforward. In fact, it reminds me of my bed. I know that sounds weird, but I have this eight sleep bed that has active cooling built into it. Now, if you imagine taking that bed and rejiggering it into a jacket, that's pretty much what you would need. You'd need active cooling ribbons that would take the heat from your body out while collecting all that water and catching it for purification. I think we could do that today and I think it would work. So check mark, yes, this one could work. Now let's talk about cooling. Now, if you do have a jacket with ribbons to collect all the heat, you still have to have a way of moving it. And that means a heat pump. And now there are a couple of different ways that we could do this. The first would be a Peltier chip, which is a really cool little device. It is a steady state chip with two sides. One side gets hot, and one side gets cold in the presence of energy input. So this is actually how really small refrigerators work. And there's a couple of different other use cases, but this one's interesting because of the packaging. They're so thin, you could actually make them in small form factors and put them in places that don't bend, you know, non-joint sections. And there you could have the heat discharged outside, making it cooler on the inside. Or you could have all that water pump into a central reservoir and have a big Peltier chip like on your back, for example, or chest, where all that heat is being dissipated. That's interesting. Now, of course, there's also a traditional refrigerant cycle, like the thing that we all have in our homes, our air conditioning systems. Here, you have a compressor and evaporator, and you take advantage of a refrigerant that could actually become a liquid and a gas and conveniently move heat based on that phase change. Now, the challenge with a really hot environment like Iraqis, where it's 150 degrees outside, is you need to have a very strategic choice for your working fluid, something that can actually operate in that temperature range. So our refrigerant that we use, R134, here on Earth might not be the right choice, but there's probably a clever way to get around that. But you don't have to live in the Dune cinematic universe to understand the value of fresh water. 
For us mere mortals here on Earth, our sponsor this week, Lark, has you covered. This is the Lark Pure Viz bottle, and it's got a little engineering trick up its sleeve. This is Pure Viz technology, which intelligently activates every two hours to purify water and inner surfaces, neutralizing 99% of biocontaminants such as E. coli. It also means you never have to worry about a stinky bottle ever again, and we've all been there. I haven't traveled beyond Earth just yet, but I do travel a lot, and you guys know Lark bottles always come with me on these trips that I go on. With a full charge, it lasts up to one month, and its double wall vacuum insulation keeps your cold drinks cold for up to 24 hours. It's way more hygienic than regular reusable bottles, and it's non-toxic, mercury-free, BPA-free, and phthalate-free. Plus, you can feel good knowing it uses 99% recyclable packaging, and every purchase supports clean water facilities in Kenya and the cleanup of ocean-bound single-use plastics. It comes in two sizes and five colors, and you can even upgrade to the filtered cap for on-the-go filtration. It improves taste for a smooth finish and removes lead, chlorine, PFAS, and particulates. So level up your water game with the beautiful Lark Pure Viz bottle today. Links in the description. Huge thanks to Lark and you. Now back to the show. The third choice would actually be pretty interesting and difficult to pull off, and that would be a Stirling engine. These are examples of Stirling engines, and they work in a really interesting way. If I were to provide heat on one side of this plate, for example, then that heat would be transferred to this side and do work. So I could take this energy from this wheel and do work, like move a piston or something. But the opposite is also true. If I move this piston, then I could actually move heat from one side to the other. Now this is a really cool contraption, but as you can see, they're really big and they don't do very much in terms of volume. So for packaging in a bodysuit, the Stirling engine probably wouldn't be the best fit. This probably wouldn't work. So for our still suit, I think the Peltier chip and the refrigerant-based heat pump could both work. But of course, with the refrigerant-based heat pump, you need to have a compressor and evaporator. It's quite a bit more bulky, takes a little more power. I'm not sure that we would have all the room for that. The Peltier chip actually would be my vote. So could we cool the suit? Yes, that also does work. So far, so good. How about the next challenge? which would be breathing. Now this one might be surprising, but you lose quite a bit of water just from breathing out, right? We have vapors that are actually being discharged. You notice it on a really cold day because the moisture actually condenses and you can kind of see it visually. So how do they tackle that in Dune? Well, they have these filt plugs, which are almost like ear plugs for your nose. And they actually expand and make a really tight seal to keep any moisture from evaporating out. And the tubes then, capture all that moisture, maybe run it through that entire Peltier chip cooling process to condense the water out and collect it for reuse. But in the movie, if you notice, it was actually more like just a tube that was in your nose, like an oxygen tube to help you with higher levels of oxygen. But that wouldn't work because a lot of the moisture would just go around that tube. You need to have like a hermetically sealed device. And those would be really uncomfortable really quickly. If you've ever worn earplugs for any period of time, it gets uncomfortable. And this would be the same thing, probably even cause calluses around your nostril openings. And of course, the key is you breathe in through your mouth and you breathe out through that nose plug, the felt plug to capture all the condensation. Could we build that system? Probably, I mean, we'd have to have a way to get all that air and condense the moisture out, but we could probably close that loop pretty decently. Then there's probably the hardest challenge of all. And the part that I don't think the movies in Hollywood really did it justice, which is the urine and feces collection. And it's also really difficult from an engineering perspective because that suit is actually extracting the moisture out of your poop and collecting it back and cleaning it and filtering it for reuse. And just remember that the harder something is to push through uh, a sieve or some kind of osmotic membrane to collect the water, the more force is required, the more energy that you need. And this suit is supposed to be completely passive, not have any batteries or any other sort of input, just the energy from moving around and other natural bodily functions. This one, I'm gonna say, would not work. I don't see any way that you could possibly collect all the water content from your poop as well. Now there's the question of water treatment. Now this is where it gets really interesting because one of the challenges that we do really have here on earth is desalination. We have kind of the opposite problem of dune where the dune environment is so harsh that there's very little human life and very little water. Earth, our wonderful planet, is the opposite. There's tons of natural resources and a huge human population, but there's so many of us that we also have water scarcity challenges. And desalination is a big way that we solve it. But how about in a suit 
that you walk around in. That's a fair bit trickier. And that's because desalination works with a couple of different methods. One that we've all seen is boiling water on your stove. That's really energy intensive and requires a heat source, which wouldn't work in this suit. The second way would be a reverse osmosis system, like the one you might have under your sink in your kitchen to have a little spigot of fresh, clean water. And reverse osmosis will remove pretty much everything from the water and give you true, pure, clean drinking water. But the problem is the pressures required to actually make it work. That under sink reverse osmosis system that you might have in your house is actually really wasteful. And that's because all you have is around 60 or 70 PSI, which is what the utility is pumping into your water line. And at that pressure, there's a lot of waste. Yes, you do get some fresh water, but there's a hose you have to connect to the drain because a lot of the water is actually just going right down the drain. To get really efficient and to get most of the water out, you need really high pressures. And that's why desalination plants work around 1500 to 2500 PSI pressure, a hundred times higher than ambient air. And at those pressures, you can actually force the water through really tight membranes and get all the water out and have very, very little discharge to have to deal with. And this is where the system starts to break down. Yes, you can collect all the water at just a nasty mess of sweat and piss that you could do. But to clean that water would be incredibly difficult because the entire still suit is made to operate with just the input of walking and moving, right? For example, you could take the force from each heel press to run a pump, right? Every step you take, you could get that energy to run some kind of a pump. But as we mentioned, the sheer pressures involved make it really difficult. Also, 1500 PSI or 500 PSI, something like that, means really high, strong tubing, which also has to be flexible and bendable to move around with you. That is a major engineering challenge. And it's where this entire system kind of falls flat. Could you collect all this liquid goop and take it home somewhere and have it clean? Probably. And that could probably make sense. That's what I really think is more viable. But cleaning water and desalinating it on site in a bodysuit that you can walk around in, probably not gonna happen. And sound off in the comments below if you think I'm wrong or I'm, there's a technology that I'm not thinking of, but I can't see that happening. Finally, number six, we have energy. And this really is at the core of the problem as you heard before. To run a cooling loop, you can run a Peltier chip or a heat pump with electricity. But where do you get that from? The question really comes down to the scale of how much you're producing and how much you need. To cool your body in a 150 degree environment is really difficult. Think of it like this. Imagine trying to push a rock down a hill. Easy, right? Well, that's what it's like when the outside temperature is, let's say, 75 degrees or 22 degrees Celsius, right? That's really easy because you have a nice gradient, 20 degrees cooler than your body, and your heat is just naturally flowing out of your body and you stay very comfortable. If the weather was 98 degrees, the same temperature as your body, that heat would have nowhere to go and you'll start to feel really sick because your body has a lot of natural metabolic processes. You're moving around or even if you're just sitting around like I was yesterday watching Dune, you're still burning calories and that heat has to go somewhere. And then there's the absolute extreme of trying to stay cool on Iraqis where it's 150 degrees or whatever the temperature is during the day. In that situation, that would be like pushing a rock up a hill. Now your body has to reject heat into an environment that is much hotter. Could you make enough energy walking and with all the natural motions, like maybe you're breathing in and out, can move some kind of a membrane and produce energy? We're talking such minute amounts of energy. I just don't see that happening. Now, if we wanted to make that work in the real world, solar panels, for example, maybe the entire suit on the outside is covered in solar panels. Now this would actually take the heat that comes from the sun on this planet and produce electricity, meaning that that heat is not then transferred to your suit and then into you. So it would both cool you generally by consuming that energy, but also produce more electricity, allowing you to run a Peltier chip or something else. So I do believe that with a combination of heel, walking, pressure, you know, <laughs> springs or something to, to get that kinetic energy combined with solar panels, I th think you could probably build a suit that would keep you cool, at least a lot cooler than you would be without it. Here's one more challenge, by the way, with Dune that they didn't mention. They're walking on a very sandy planet. 
That's also really bad. Well, it's great if you wanna be comfortable because there's a lot less impact. The sand moves out of the way as you're stepping, but it also means that each step has less impulse and that energy is being robbed by the sand and therefore not converted to electricity from some kind of a kinetic energy generation system. So that's another challenge that they would have that we probably wouldn't have here on Earth. One question I had when I was starting the preparation and research for the script is, how does it compare to like a spacesuit that an astronaut would wear? Well, they have the opposite problem. In the void of space, there's really nothing else around to collect heat. And so it is nearly absolute zero out there. So the astronaut spacesuit is actually an insulative material to keep all your heat in, which is kind of the opposite problem. Also, they're not exactly water retention focused. That's not really a, a primary objective. Now going to Mars, maybe you would have to be. And that actually is, I think, where this still suit technology will first take form is in the Martian prototype suits for the future. When we colonize Mars, if we colonize Mars, when we colonize Mars, we're gonna have to figure this out because water would be as scarce on Mars as it is in the Dune universe. This is just another classic example of how important science fiction is. For all the science fiction fans out there, how'd you guys feel about the movies Dune 1 and now Dune 2? Did it kind of stay true to the book? Did you guys like them? It's so hard to make a two hour movie from a book that has all the material and all the time to truly set and create the world. But I do think that the importance of science fiction is in how we can take these ideas and actually maybe find interesting ways of bringing it into the actual world. Do we need a still suit here on earth? Probably not. I don't know, maybe in like Phoenix and in, in summertime maybe, but no, by and large we don't. But some of the technology could end up in other products that we actually do need. And like we mentioned, desalination is gonna be one of the great challenges of our time. And if we can find ways of doing it with lower energy input, that would be an absolute game changer. All right, I'd love to know what you guys think. This is one of those where I really lean on you to let us know, did I miss something? Is there more information from like the Dune fan wikis that I've missed? Sound off in the comments below. And until next week, check out this video next.